Yes, the, uh, the third member of the motivators. Two of them are here, and here is Richard. So let me begin this little story. I have a habit, a tendency in my life, of being in a minority of one. I don't know what causes it. I seem to be a square peg in a round hole. And this present, this um, today is no exception. What am I doing here at a conference on the history of radio astronomy? I'm not a historian. I'm not a radio astronomy. Never have been, either way. Nor even married to one. At least Martha was married to a historian. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, I'm, in the, I'm the only one in step, which is a rather uncomfortable position to be. But let me just for one minute sh explain how I do have a, quite a, a rational reason for being here today. As an optical astronomer, for 25 years, for a quarter of a century, I used photographic plates. It was our receiver. It was what we had, and everybody used them. And because of the project I was doing, I needed to continue with the same receiver for as long as I could. So a whole quarter of a century. By that time, everybody else had deserted the ship and gone electronic, but I was still using plates. And so I got a reputation for being interested in this, these historical receivers. And that somehow got me into the Casca Heritage Committee, which had some sort of uh, rapport with, with uh, older things and their relationships with modern things. And then through a moment of acute weakness, because there was nobody else around who was possibly um, willing to do so, I got picked up as the, the chair of this wretched organization. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when when um, it happened that, um, that one of the past very powerful and leaders of that, of that heritage committee, Richard Garrell, uh, passed away, I then was uh, contacted by the by Cashier saying, could we prepare an obituary for him? To do that, I needed to contact the only person who really knew all the facts well, his widow, Martha. And from there, we learned that Richard had prepared and was intending to write a book on the history of radio astronomy in Canada. Now, he was doing this not from the, from the perspective of a radio astronomy astronomer, because he wasn't one, although he had a good here a huge interest in that, but from his own perspective of the impact that, uh, that big technology can have in a community and on the way in which a government, as well as a nation, thinks of itself. So, we have Richard Jarrell. I met him at a couple of times at uh, the uh, meetings of the Canadian uh, Science, Science and Technology History Association, of which he was a co-founder. I learned straight away that he was brilliant at starting things. He had a fire and a passion for getting things going and for knowing when to move back, let other people take off, but it was, it was okay, it was self-consistent, and then going to something else. So he did have, a, though, a very strong interest in astronomy, though it wasn't his main uh, outlook in life. Martha, what was this interest in astronomy that you, how could you describe it? Well, he had a fascination um, of thinking about the wonders of the universe. And this started when he was very, very young. He had um, his first uh, telescope was a refractor. It was a secondhand one. He painted it white. And he was about eight or nine when his family moved to the country. He grew up in a small town in southern Indiana. They moved to the country. And he, of course, was seeing wonderful nighttime skies. And um, that just fed his interest. He also was reading um, German astronomy journals from a very young age, in German, and obviously, and um, that fed his knowledge about astronomy. So then, when the family moved back to take care of, I think, the, the, the Gerald mother, the, the grandmother, the paternal uh, grandmother, um, in Connersville, the two boys, he and his brother, had a sister and a brother, and the two boys had shared a room, um, and he painted all the constellations on the ceiling in phosphorescent paint. And Terry, his younger, his, the younger brother, said he loved to crawl into bed at night and um, wait for Richard to turn off the light. And then he could see the nighttime sky. So you know, this um, love of astronomy was started from a very young age, and it continued throughout his entire life. And a born teacher, too, a born mm. leader of, of, of his, his passion and uh, um, uh, promulgating it to other people. Didn't he start writing as well? 
He, di he did, yes, yes. He started, um, well, he first started teaching. He taught his younger brother and sister. He would set up a table in their room, and he would stand behind, and he'd put two chairs over there and say, Terry and Marsha, you, you sit there, and I'm going to teach you. And he did this in the country. He did it in Connersville. But he also he had a favorite cousin, Steve, who was, um, um, he wanted to be a parish priest, and he is a parish priest today, a very loved one. Anyway, they were very, very close. And so when the family moved back to Connersville, Steve and, and uh, Richard got together. Richard said, let's write an astronomy book. So they did. Uh, Steve, How old were they? Uh, 13, 14, yeah, young, 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 young teenagers. So Richard did the writing. Steve tells me I just had, I visited Steve a couple of weeks ago, and he said Richard did the writing, and Steve did all the illustrations. They put it all together and went door to door. <laughs> And sold copies in their tiny town. I so, British entrepreneurial <laughs> skills when they're only 13 to write a book about the topic, not being formally educated, in, go to the neighbors and sell it. <laughs> yeah. And then he went on mm. to teach more formally later on at the university level? Yes, yes. When he became, um, <clears throat> when he went to study, he studied um, his PhD thesis in, at U of T was on Michael Meslin. So he was still carrying through his love of astronomy. <clears throat> and when he got hired at York as a lecturer, he, um, he did s quite a few courses in astronomy, things like, um, things like life in outer space. Um, let's see here. Uh, just give you some titles. Um, Emergence of cosmology as science, exploration of the universe, the earth in, t in time and space, that, that sort of thing. And he carried it on later, too. He did some... some um, um, uh, thesis supervisions and and required readings. No, no special topics by by uh, graduate students in in astronomy still. Mm -hmm. But he was looking at this as also from the point of view of the impact of teaching astronomy or knowing about astronomy rather than the pure the pure fact of astronomy. It was the impact that that the the topic could have. Um, he I think he he but he understood and practiced. The, the motto that everybody has a right to know and to wonder at the sky. And that he sort of practiced it in the way he, he I mean, the cold light of dawn is a good example when he wrote that mm. book. It was looking at the impact and the wealth of a pure, a pure science with no, no practical applications like astronomy, like optical astronomy, but the wealth mm. that could bring to people. And, and you, you, you really saw this in all the other things he did in life too. He didn't just limit it to, to, to uh, history of science, did he? No, no. Well, actually, when, when he was teaching in, in um, uh, when he started at York, his, the other courses that he taught were courses in uh, Canadi Canadian science and technology courses. And he was very much a part of getting the department set up, which is it's finally a department now at York. So he... Um, um, yes, it was very important for him to look how science affected humans, and which is why he also co-founded the CSTHA. It was is trying to see this connection between science and humans, and how does how do the discoveries in science affect humans? Um, and because he read the Globe and Mail every day thoroughly, not the sports page and not the business pages, I don't think, but but he was his interests were in um, science. Uh, education, government, and he looked at how these aspects of human um, existence affected each other. He had a holistic lens, and so that's where his thoughts were. And, and he was adamant too, wasn't he, that um, the government must not neglect its scientific heritage. Um, Richard, Richard was particularly strong out of the, the Ottawa Museum that, that this, was, this was something vital. With, if, you do, if you neglected your heritage, you somehow neglected your own roots. And this was a very important feature, that, that there must be a strong, strong um, movement to uh, respect, restore, and preserve those, those roots. So the, the book that he was planning, but he, um, he unfortunately, we, we know that he was intended to start writing it within a few months of his exceedingly untimely death, um, two years ago. End of 2013, End of two and a half. Yes. Uh, we know that he, he had produced uh, contents chat, uh, lists, but actually he produced two, so he wasn't quite clear 
as to the exact angle that this book would take. And he was also going to cut it off in the early 1990s um, because he had done a tremendous amount of research. He'd interviewed lots of people. He'd actually uh, uh, started the, um, the Casca Heritage's long program of making recordings of senior uh, Canadian astronomers when they got reached retirement age. Um, and, uh, but his, he had focused totally on radio astronomers because these were going to provide the meat for the book that he'd done. He'd done lots and lots of um, note-taking and left a, a filing cabinet drawer full of, full of materials which Martha has very nobly been sorting through. And we do have now transcripts of all the tapes, over 30 tapes that he wrote, that he, he prepared. So we do have those materials for the book. And although he was planning to, apparently to have stopped when his own section of research had stopped in 1991, I think, 1996, we think it would now be better to pick up from that book and carry on to the much bigger expansion that has taken place since then, so that we get more of the story as well as Richard's story. And that's, that's the vision of the book that we have for, it's going to be still Richard's book, but it will be um, with some new color, color added to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately. Uh, any, any questions mm -hmm. for uh, Mark Lawrence about the book project? Uh, yeah, that's a very important part of these two days. We're getting collecting your stories. We're documenting them. Uh, we're trying to make contacts so that we can get these stories in publishable form. Uh, so please let's uh, let's stay in touch. And if you're interested in contributing, please see Elizabeth, see me, see Jasper, talk to Mark. That'd be very very helpful. Uh, thank you again.